a client met his banker to discuss opening a restaurant in a busy airport. In us, he found a partner that understood the importance of reaching for the sky. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. An avid cyclist dreams of turning his passion into a business. He consults his banker to help find the best path. Now bike wheels are being built and all it took was a little push to get rolling. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Clint. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello once again, and thank you for joining us on the Space Nuts podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Dunkley, and this is a, a show all about astronomy and space science where we discuss things that are happening in the, uh, in the greater universe or right here on Earth or somewhere in between. And today we're going to look back at one of the major biblical events, the uh, destruction of a city in the Middle East, the legend of Sodom and Gomorrah. And now we think it might have been a Tunguska-like event that uh, could have occurred. So we'll uh, be uh, looking into that. Also, the giant red spot on Jupiter, the... Um, uh, the storm that's been raging for hundreds of years looks like it's speeding up, which makes me wonder if it will blow itself out sooner or later. We'll uh, we'll find out. Uh, we'll also be looking at some audience questions. Uh, we've got a, a query about something we talked about recently, the heat death of the universe. Someone's uh, come up with a, a, another element to that that they want to discuss. Uh, we also have a question about uh, whether or not a neutron star has an event horizon. And a text question from uh, a fella named John Dunkley. Uh, his question is uh, about the interstellar medium, but he also has a second question that we're going to run uh, with as well, which I'll explain later in the program. Joining me as always, my partner in crime, the great man himself, Professor Fred <laughs> Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Oh, it's nice to be called a great man. It's usually just an old man that I get these days. <laughs> yes, I've been known to do that too, I think. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. <laughs> How are you, old man? Ah, yes. Um, yeah. I'm well, and uh, I hope you are too. Yeah, doing fine, thanks. I'm looking forward to getting out of lockdown. It can't be, it can't be too far away now. A bit the, over a week? We're told it's the 11th of October. Fingers uh, crossed. Yeah, fingers, fingers crossed. crossed. Yeah. Actually, my wife's been called back to work already because she's got to get the shop organised and there you go. Um, yeah. get all the stock on the floor and all that sort of stuff. So, she's actually at work today, uh, not seeing customers, just um, you know, Getting pushing it. all the bells and whistles yeah. where they need to be pushed. Pushed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yes, it's it's just about to come back, and it, as as we start to see things improve in New South Wales, they've blown up in Victoria. Yeah. Good grief! Yeah. So this will be their third wave, I'd say. But um, yeah, it's a very unfortunate. Some people call it the fifth. Yeah. <laughs> Not well, sure, yeah. Mm, or the fifth <laughs> column, perhaps. I don't know. Maybe yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Fred. Let's uh, let's get down to business, and we're going to um, look at this this uh, incredible story about the um, the Middle Eastern city. It's now called Tal el Hammam, but about thirty six hundred years ago, it was uh, pretty well wiped off the face of the earth. And of course, the legend goes that it was the hand of God punishing humanity. But now um, it's starting to look like it might have been an astronomical event. Uh, indeed, that's right. So th this is um, it's an archaeological site, <clears throat> excuse me, which uh, is in the Jordan Valley, um, northeast of the Dead Sea, uh, in I, I guess what we still call the Holy Land. Um, it's uh, it's a, a site that has been uh, investigated for. I think more than 15 years. It's very well established. Um, and it was a city uh, about 3,600 years ago that was at that time 10 times larger than Jerusalem. Wow. Five times larger than Jericho. So this was no mean place. It was a big city. Um, uh, and 
as you say, it's uh, it's known as Tol. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this, but Tol El Homam is probably something like it. And I think you were probably nearer to it than me there, but never mind. Um, but uh, the, the investigations of the archaeology there have revealed, you know, the structure of the city. But uh, what is really interesting is that there's this this uh, layer in the uh, in the archaeological record. So you, so you dig down. It's a bit like geology. You sort of dig down and uh, see what you find. Mm. And there's a, a one and a half meter uh, layer of strata, I guess that you'd call it, which is very unusual um, and. It's actually something called the Middle Bronze Age II stratum. Doesn't mean much to me because I'm not an archaeologist, but uh, it's a long time ago, uh, three thousand six hundred years, and there's there's debris in that layer, which is not just um, the stuff that you get if if you'd had either an invasion or a huge earthquake or even a volcanic eruption. Um, there is stuff like bits of pottery uh, whose outer surfaces have been melted into glass. Whoa. Um, Partially melted building material, uh, all sorts of things. And uh, one of the the researchers uh, who's been working on this uh, project, James Kennett, who's at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, um, he comments that we saw evidence for temperatures greater than 2,000 degrees Celsius. Uh, and um, those are basically temperatures that you just don't get uh, from either earthquakes or war or whatever. Well, and- the, only, the only thing you would get something like that from would be a volcano or a, or a lava burst or a, py- a pyroclastic flow, and I imagine that wouldn't have been an issue in that, that part of the world. That's right, yes. But, but uh, in fact, the temperatures that, that they've seen, you don't experience even in a cataclysm like that. Right. Um, these are higher even than volcanic uh, volcanic, um, you know, remnants, uh, mm. uh, sorry, volcanic materials. Um, although, yes, you do get um, volcanic glass being formed by high temperatures. Anyway, the, the, what they're saying is there's only one possible event that could have produced that, and that is an airburst uh, wow. from a an incoming, probably small asteroid. And they're suggesting... Something like the Tunguska event that you and I have spoken about many times before, which was in 1908, uh, an airburst over the eastern Siberian region um, of Russia. Uh, and that was sort of the calculations show that that was about 12 megatons mm. uh, in terms of its explosive power. And they're suggesting that this one was similar. But I think as well, from reading between the lines, they're also suggesting that the airburst was lower down in the atmosphere, uh, a, a matter of you know a few kilometres rather than uh, probably a bit more than that, that Tunguska exploded. Remember, Tung- Tunguska devastated oh, yes. thousands of square kilometres of, of forest. Yeah, just laid it to matchwood. Yeah, that, that's right. So, I, think, uh, I think there was one fatality. That yes. I yeah. Read about. Yeah. 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 No. It, it's. It, yeah. Anyway, it's it's um, it, it, it's uh, what is being calculated that um, that airburst is is actually the uh, the only thing that kind of produced the the phenomena they've seen. Um, one of the other things that um, uh, Professor Kennett said uh, is, I think one of the main discoveries is shocked quartz. These are sand grains containing cracks that form only under very high pressure. Um, we've we have shocked quartz from this layer, and that means there were incredible pressures involved to shock the quartz crystals. Quartz is one of the hardest minerals; it's very mm-hmm. hard to shock. <laughs> um, and there's all sorts of fascinating aspects to it. Um, uh, they they suggest that the explosion levelled the city effectively. Um, the palace was four stories high. That was flattened, 
uh, pretty well. Um, and the, there's a comment that says that the distribution of bones indicated extreme disarticulation and skeletal fragmentation in nearby humans. So people were blown to pieces, basically, by Jeez. whatever whatever happened. So, um, so do you think it wiped out the entire population? Uh, yes, um, that's pretty well what they're saying in this research. Uh, what's curious is that um, t- t- a couple of things are curious. First of all, the place was remained uninhabited then for 600 years. Um, and the suggestion is that the reason for that is that nothing would grow in the area because there was there's an anomalously high amount of salt in the in the debris um they find an uh, anomalously high concentrations of salt an average of four percent in the sediment and as high as 25 percent in some samples and uh, again professor kennett says the salt was thrown up due to the high impact pressures um and apparently um One of the comments, well, he says, and it may be that the impact partially hit the Dead Sea, which is rich in salt. Yeah. Uh, The local shores of the Dead Sea are also salt rich. So it it may well have been that this, uh, you know, this explosion spread salt all over the the countryside Um, and a nearby city which has been uh, proposed to be the biblical Jericho. Remember that Places like Sodom and Gomorrah and Jericho, we don't know where they were mm. these days. We don't even know whether they actually existed historically. But um, there is one city, Tel Es Sultan, pr- proposed as the biblical Jericho, uh, which um, they're suggesting underwent violent destruction at the same time. Uh, it is so, incredible to contemplate, isn't it? it just the, that's right. And so it, it's only 600 years after that, devastation that you start to see resettlement uh, mm. in this area and so um well the 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 debate um uh, i'll just read this is from uh, um the uh, actually it's not it's physics physics work of physics.org that um, this comes from but there is a con- uh, conversation article as well that's got a lot a lot of detail in it um Tal uh, Tal al-Haman has been the focus of an ongoing debate as to whether it could be the biblical city of Sodom, one of the two cities in the Old Testament book of Genesis that were destroyed by God for how wicked they and their inhabitants had become. One denizen, Lot, is saved by two angels who instruct him not to look behind as they flee. Lot's wife, however, lingers and is turned into a pillar of salt. Meanwhile, fire and brimstone fell from the sky. Multiple cities were destroyed. Thick smoke arose from the fires. City inhabitants were killed and area crops were destroyed in what sounds like an eyewitness account of a cosmic impact event. It it's does. a satisfying connection to make. So there's no guarantee. There's no scientific proof. Uh, you know, um, what Professor Kennett says is all the observations stated in Genesis are consistent with a cosmic air bo- burst, yeah. but there's no scientific proof that the, this destroyed city is indeed the Sodom of the Old Testament. But, it, but it's, the evidence it, does suggest whatever city it is probably was devastated by an air yeah. burst from an, a small asteroid. Exactly. And and it's they're saying, you know, p- perhaps that generated an oral tradition and it would be a long lasting one if it if there was nobody there for 600 years. But you can imagine that in the area that would be known by all the local people that this city had been wiped out, um, you know, even 600 years after the event. Um, that's a long time. But. Um, we remember things that happened in the Middle Ages, well, mostly because they were written down. But yep. you know, um, but but it, it may account. It may they're suggesting it may be the inspiration for what is in the Book of Genesis. Yes, quite incredible. And the the other uh, information that's sort of come to light is uh, we talk about the evidence of the temperatures on this on this city. Uh, and the, and the glassing or the glass that's been created, they they also f- have found microscopic diamonds that were created yeah, by the heat, which is just amazing. Absolutely. And the only other places where they've found evidence of such temperatures is Tunguska and yeah. Chicxulub, which is yeah. uh, where the dinosaur asteroid yeah. uh, hit Earth yeah. and uh, was the beginning of the end of the dinosaurs or the end of the end of the dinosaurs, whichever way you want to look at it. So, um, yes, uh, I, and we've... 
in recent times witnessed something similar, although not as devastating, yeah. but uh, that was um, in Russia with that um, uh, atmospheric explosion. Chelyabinsk, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, if it, that had it sort of exploded lower down, could have been much, much worse, much yes. worse. Yeah. So uh, quite an extraordinary uh, situation and, and one that's worth looking into further um, and... Yeah, who knows where the evidence will will lead? This is uh, this is quite an amazing revelation. I know they've been talking about it on our podcast Facebook page hmm. uh, because um, the, the story was was published there um, recently, and and people were wondering, oh, is this real? What, you know, where's the evidence? Uh, but if yeah, if it is real, if it is the the city of of legend from the Bible. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> um, I don't know how we prove it, I suppose, is the, yes, the, that's the right. most it's... difficult part of it all. But uh, even so, it does sound like this was an astronomical event of some significance and, mm. and devastated um, a lot of people. I also read that uh, they would have seen the flash before the actual um, oh. devastation took place and they looked up and were blinded. So um, yeah. that, that's uh, probably in burned. itself. Probably burned yeah. as well. It would be, right. oh, look, it would have been horrible. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the shockwave takes a little while to come down through the atmosphere and basically devastates the entire landscape. Yeah, yeah just horrible stuff. Yeah, um, unbelievable. Mm. So there it is. The legend of Sodom and Gomorrah may well have been, may well have been an ast astronomical event. If it wasn't that city, it was some other city that certainly suffered that, uh, that terrible fate. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Now let's take a little break and talk about our sponsor NordVPN. If you're looking for a virtual private network to secure your online activity, you can get nothing better than NordVPN. And as a Space Nuts listener, they have a very special offer for you. And I'll give you the URL so you can log on and have a look shortly. But uh, with VPN, uh, it basically shields you from people who might try to steal your money from your bank accounts or get your bank account details, for example. Uh, it could also hide you from prying eyes. It uh, basically creates a, a shield to hide your online activity. And that is really important these days. The uh, number of scams that are going on around the world are inexplicably high. And uh, so many people getting caught to the tune of um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you don't want to be one of those victims. So uh, once you're connected, you're uh, free to enjoy the Internet in complete privacy. All your online data is unreadable. So that's something to think about. It's also uh, the most efficient uh, service available in the world today, uh, NordVPN. So it is well worth the money. And what's more, as a Space Nuts listener, you get a two-year deal with a bonus four months at 73% off, 73% off the price for a two-year plan with four months extra. So uh, it's a great way to celebrate VPN Awareness Month. Yes, that's a thing, uh, VPN Awareness Month. So the URL that you need to log on to to take advantage of this offer as a Space Nuts listener is nordvpn.com slash space nuts. That's nordvpn.com slash space nuts. Have a look today and enjoy 73% off the going rate for NordVPN on a two-year plan with a four-month bonus thrown in. nordvpn.com slash space nuts. Now back to the show. Zero G and I feel fine. Space nuts. And actually, that little link uh, reminds me of um, the recent mission with uh, all the civilians doing their uh, launch into into space. And uh, yeah, they uh, they would have felt fine uh, <laughs> experiencing zero g. I I imagine. Uh, I, this, I just re sorry. <laughs> go, go ahead. No, I was just going to say this is Space Nuts with <laughs> Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Fred, what were you going to say? I was just going to mention that um, I read this morning that there's a, a rumour that William Shatner might be the ne one of the next passengers on the Blue Origin, uh, uh, you know, the Blue Origin suborbital flights. Yeah. Jeff Bezos' uh, system. So Captain Kirk going up there in zero G, that would be great. I, I also hear he's just released his new album. So uh, he's still going strong in, in his 90s. 
Yeah, he's even older than me. Oh, <laughs> is he? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had to do it. You had to I do had it. to do yes, it. You had to do it. That's yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, now, our next story is focused on Jupiter, and it's focused on a focal point of Jupiter, and that is the Great Red Spot, which is a, a storm, a pretty darn big storm that's been sort of um, rotating for centuries and is one of the uh, uh, most spectacular things you can see astronomically. Uh, within our solar system. Uh, we know a little bit about this particular storm and we've just been told uh, through analysis of Hubble images that it looks like it's speeding up. Now, this is a storm you wouldn't want sort of descending upon the greater parts of Earth. <laughs> um, it would probably have the same effect as the asteroid that uh, might have destroyed that biblical city, I reckon. And um, <laughs> how, how many Earths can you fit inside the red spot? Well, it, it yeah, it's it's down to about one now uh, because oh, the spot it? the spot shrinking, yeah, but it's still bigger than the planet, uh, bigger than our planet. Uh, yeah, this phenomenon that has been observed, um, I, I should check when it was actually first observed, but it's a couple of hundred years, maybe even longer, that um, the Great Red Spot has been observed on Jupiter. Uh, in fact, it would be longer because. 200 years ago, they had pretty decent telescopes. So uh, it's a long lasting storm. Um, it, it's basically a cyclonic region in, uh, in, in one of the cloud belts of Jupiter, Jupiter's uh, atmosphere. And being. 18, 1878, they first spotted it. Well, actually, no, it was um, first discovered in 1665. That sounds more like it. By uh, sounds... Gian Cassini. The good old Cassini. So he also, of course, discovered the uh, uh, discovered Titan. Actually, mm. uh, is that right? No, that was Huygens discovered Titan. Anyway, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm getting my history mixed up. But he's a good lad, was Cassini, um, <laughs> uh, Italian, but worked at the Paris Observatory. Uh, so. Um, using telescopes made by the great Campani, who was one of the great lens makers of the time. Mm. That, that that's, um, doesn't surprise me at all that he discovered it in 1660. What was it, 1668, did you say? Yeah, I think so. That sounds yeah. about right. Um, so it's, it's, it's been going for at least, uh, you know, getting on for 400 years, 350 years or something like that. Very, very uh, long-lived feature. Anyway, the, the point is, that uh, unlike Cassini, uh, we now have something called the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, which has been observing Jupiter pretty well since 1990 when it was when it was first put into orbit, uh, and um, so we've got these this long record of uh, the way the Great Red Spot behaves, and this is where this these results come from. That um, the analysis of those records show that. The wind speed um, on the, near the outer edge of the of the cyclone, the storm, uh, in a region which is known as the high speed ring, um, it's getting higher. Uh, it, since between two thousand and nine and two thousand and twenty, its speed increased by up to eight percent. Mm. Whereas actually, when you look near the centre of the red spot, the winds are moving more slowly, uh, so they've slowed down. So there's this interesting, you know, imbalance, or perhaps it's a balance between the the uh, the, the, the slow speeds near the centre of the spot and the rapid speeds near the outside. Uh, and those those uh, speeds near the outside is that they're more than six hundred kilometers per hour. So this is, you know, these are they're not the highest speeds in the solar system. I think they're about seven hundred kilometers per hour, uh, which I think are on Neptune. But they're pretty damn fast, and uh, it, it's the fact that it's speeding up is what's really puzzling researchers. Um, one of them, Michael Wong of the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, says, when I initially saw the results, I asked, does this make sense? But this is something only Hubble can do. Hubble's longevity and ongoing observations make this revelation possible. Uh, he goes on to say, 
Since we don't have a storm chaser plane at Jupiter, we can continuously measure the winds on site. We can't continue th- continuously measure the winds on site. Actually, I'm misquoting there. That's not from Michael Wong. This is Amy Simon of uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, who goes on to say Hubble is the only telescope that has the kind of temporal coverage and spatial resolution that can capture Jupiter's winds in this detail. Mm. What about James Webb when it's finally launched? And yeah. Uh, it, it might be able to dig even deeper. That's right. Um, um, the, the James Webb will certainly have a, the, you know, the, um, the the red spot as one of its targets. Remember, the James Webb actually looks in the infrared, and Jupiter is mm. significantly different in appearance in the infrared from what it is in the visible spectrum. Um, and that's because you're seeing down below the, the cloud layers uh, at uh, the, the warmer region uh, underneath the, the sur- surface layers of cloud. Uh, nevertheless, we'll still learn something from it. And it, and it may be quite important because one of the, uh, one of the issues uh, with the Great Red Spot is we know that it's highly three-dimensional. Uh, Juno has demonstrated that, the Juno spacecraft, which is currently in orbit around Jupiter, yep. that... Uh, you, you know, there's the, the, it, it's um, it's not just a blob on the surface. It's like a vortex uh, which you're looking down into, and the 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 problem is that you can't actually see where the bottom is. Mm. Um, and one of the you know one of the, again one of the comments from uh, Michael Wong is uh, it's hard to diagnose what the increase in speed actually means since Hubble can't see the bottom of the storm very well. Anything below the cloud tops is invisible in the data, but it's an interesting piece of data that can help us to understand what's fueling the Great Red Spot and how it's maintaining energy. Yeah, we don't even know that, do we? But it is dissipating, is it not? Well, it would have to be, that's right. Um, But there must be some... You know, some heat source underneath it, or something of that sort. It's it's still not well understood at all mm. uh, as to um, as to what 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 is actually going on there. Could it be a tornado? Um, a big one, yeah. I mean, in many ways, that's probably what it is. It's probably certainly got vortex structure, uh, which a tornado does. Um, but it is one you know, mammoth tornado when you think about it, uh, 16,000 kilometres across. Yeah, just <laughs> stunning. Does um, Neptune have something similar? It's got a blue spot, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there, that's right. Um, Uranus is is pretty... It's got a brown de- spot. De- ...devoid of... <laughs> I'm not going to touch that one, Andrew. Okay. <laughs> it's devoid of I features. Hope not. <laughs> devoid of features, whereas um, Neptune does have features and there are spots on it. I think, yes, you're right, there's a white spot. I think there are white spots on Saturn. Yeah. But Saturn's pretty well ob- uh, observed from the point of view of storms in its atmosphere, not least by... Uh, our good friend in in Broken Hill, uh, whose name always eludes me when I... <laughs> Trevor, Trevor... Anyway, it's Trevor, uh, out in Broken Hill, who uh, is an amateur astronomer of great repute uh, and uh, does has worked with worked with the Cassini mission on storms on Saturn. Mm. It's fascinating. It is really oh, yeah. fascinating. I mean, to, to think that something so powerful and so large exists, just, you know, that you could drop Earth into it yeah, and yeah, we'd be pretty messed up. It'd be Tunguska like a million times, uh, but it, it, it's and yet we we just don't un- we know it's there. We can see it. We we've seen you know the time lapse footage of it shows how violent it is, but we just don't know anything else. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, it's modelled, you know, the, the, the theoreticians who model the atmosphere of Jupiter, and I'm sure they can allow for things like the Great Red Spot, but we don't really know what, what triggered it. Mm. <laughs> Maybe one day we'll find out, but then it might disappear before we can get, gather all the, uh, the information, <laughs> all the information. We need. <laughs> yeah. uh, But it would probably be something, you know, in the history of Jupiter, it's probably come and gone Many times, I would imagine. Would you think so? It, it, it may have done. Yes, in the in the in the four point um, the four point uh, five seven billion year history of the solar system. Um, it's Trevor Barry, by the way. There you go. I, I always think Trevor Bailey, but it's not. It's Trevor Barry. Thank you, Trevor, for all your work. Mm. <laughs> He's a great guy. 
Okay. Uh, well, um, watch this spot uh, for as long as it's there. <laughs> we may find out more and hopefully the James Webb Telescope will answer some of those questions. Uh, I think they're talking a mission launch at the end of the – when was it? I heard. It's December. December, it's yeah. For, yeah. Planned for December. Fingers crossed. Not far away. That's right. Yeah, it's people are getting excited. Mm. <laughs> okay, uh, you're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Space Nuts. Now we come to that time in the program where we uh, hand it over to the audience and they ask uh, all manner of questions, some strange, some deeply intellectual, some random. That's a good word for it. Um, and our first question this week, Fred, comes from uh, Rob. He's up in Queensland. Professor Fred and Andrew, this is Dr. Rob Scott on the Sunshine Coast. I have a question regarding the Big Bang eventual heat death of the universe. So if it's not heat death and Professor Penrose is right and we have a big crunch or um, Ginab Gib, do you guys think that the laws of physics would persist beyond the next Big Bang, or are they determined by the uh, perhaps the uh, environment in which the Big Bang first occurs and at the end of one universe and the start of another? So, yes, big questions. Uh, I expect you to get through it in at least half a podcast. Thanks, boys. <laughs> it might take that long. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Nice to hear from you. Hope all is well in uh, sunny Queensland. Uh, yeah, we, we talked about the heat death of the universe recently, and that's probably what spawned Rob's um, inquiry. Um, I think we pretty well wrote off the possibility, possibility of uh, the universe collapsing in on itself based on current evidence, did we not? We did. Um, but we, you know, who knows what might happen in the future if... Yep. Um, if dark energy suddenly switched off for whatever reason, um, then we might get a collapse leading to uh, a big crunch, as it used to be called, or, of course, uh, as Brian Schmidt calls it, the Ganab Gib, uh, the end of the Big Bang the wrong way around. <laughs> um, so that's not really seen as a likely scenario for the end of the universe, which is why we talked about the heat death. But, it, but um, Rob raises a really interesting question there, you know, if there was such a thing, would the laws of physics survive it? And would they come out mm. differently in the next, if it was a big bounce, say, so you get a collapse and then it bounces back again, you get another big bang. Would the laws of physics be the same? And it raises this whole question uh, of where the laws of physics came from, um, because that is one that really we we don't have an answer to. Um, we we use the laws of physics to to probe right back to within the first tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang event. But uh, what what made that framework? What made the laws of physics is something that uh, you know you, you might even ask the question: Is that beyond the realm of science to find out? Well, I wouldn't. I would think it's not beyond the realm of science. I think if you've got laws like that, you want to know where they come from. But I don't think anybody does. Mm. <laughs> so whether they would change after a Ganab Gib uh, is uh, a good question. Maybe Brian Schmidt knows. I should ask yeah. him next time I see him. I, I, I could – I mean, it would – it would mean something would have to change as a consequence of the collapse and the rebound yeah. effect, wouldn't it? And and that would that would almost have to be chemical. Well, or, or yeah, well, it's more it's kind of more likely to be physical. I mean, it may even be uh, that you know the clocks all get reset and suddenly you're back to time zero again. Yeah, uh, time itself might shrivel up in in a Ganab Gib. <laughs> um, and be recreated if it if it does turn into a big bounce. Philosophical questions almost, and ones that are really worth pursuing. I, mm. I think uh, Rob's question is a good one. Yeah. All right. I'll check it out. Did we actually answer it? No, no. We never answered questions, Andrew. No. 
That would go beyond <laughs> adequate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even sure we've reached adequate yet. Yeah, it's not. No. All right. Um, thanks for your uh, thought-provoking question, Rob. Uh, let's now go to the UK and hear from Clive and see what he wants. Hi, guys. This is uh, Clive from Worcestershire, England. Sorry. I love your show and I love your banter together. You two are great. Um, I I like the the thing about uh, mountains on neutron stars, and it struck me an interesting question. Does a neutron star have a radius uh, like um, an event horizon uh, beyond which the matter wouldn't be crushed to neutrons? Uh, and if so, what sort of size is that? Would it be possible with a huge enough star to have a core of neutron star material and an outer crust of something a bit less crushed? Um, be very interested to hear what you say. Thank you very much for your show. It's absolutely brilliant. Great. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> thanks, Clive, and thanks for the uh, the good wishes. Appreciate it. Glad you enjoy it. Uh, what did he want to know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, let me let me begin by uh, telling Clive that my dad used to live in Worcestershire. Oh, nice. uh, he lived he lived for a while in the village of Kempsey, and then uh, towards the end of his life moved to Kerswell Green, both of which are not too far from Worcester. So Clive probably knows those. He was a saucy areas. old bloke too, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> You're not that far from the truth there, Andrew. <laughs> Without revealing any, you know, secret family history, yeah. Mm. Um, anyway, that's... Uh, uh, that's another story. Uh, <laughs> we, might do a, we, we might do a whole podcast on that. <laughs> uh, so um, I forgot what the question. No, I haven't. Does does a neutron star have an event horizon? Yeah. And the answer to that is no, um, because it is not sufficiently gravitationally collapsed. It's got you know a neutron star has a diameter that's comparable with a city, typically 10 to 20 kilometres across. Mm. Um, but a black hole has a diameter of zero, and it's that that actually causes the intense gravitational distortion of space-time that gives rise to the event horizon. So a neutron star is just not collapsed enough, uh, not quite, even though it's the last stop on the way to a black hole. Um, you know, a, a star that's not quite massive enough to collapse to a black hole will, will be, become a neutron star. Um, but uh, no event horizon. Although um, what you can do is calculate what the event horizon diameter would be if the neutron star was actually all its mass was concentrated in a single point. I'm not sure what the answer to that is. I should have looked it up. Uh, but I do have in my head that if you collapsed all the mass of the sun to a single point. And in fact, yeah, that's probably about the same because the sun is comparable in mass with a neutron star. They're usually a bit more than the sol a solar mass, but mm -hmm. they're in the same region. So the sun's event horizon, if it was, if its whole mass was in a single point, uh, would be about six kilometers in diameter. So very small. Um, that's kind of smaller, actually, than a neutron star is physically. But the bottom line is, as I've said, it, it doesn't collapse. It, it, it doesn't form an event horizon. However, the other bit of Clive's question is uh, relevant too, though, because we do think, and the people who build models of what neutron stars look like inside do believe that they're structured in a way similar to what Clive has mentioned, that you've got a different kind of structure near the centre, and I think on the outside, you've got uh, uh, something that's actually more uh, populated by protons than neutrons, which is why they can have magnetic fields. Neutrons are not electrically conducting. So, um, so you've got to have some sort of uh, proton me type mechanism to have the magnetic fields. So there is, there is this structure, perhaps with a skin of different material on the outside and the mountains. Um, Check them out on Wikipedia. There's a lot of information there about the, the what we think the structure of uh, neutron stars is. Yeah, they're, they're strange things, aren't they? Very the, strange. Yeah. What were the height of the mountains? A third of a millimetre um, or something like that? Yeah, think, something like that. About it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Call that a um, mountain. <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Edmund Hillary would be very disappointed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, he would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, thank you, Clive. Lovely to hear from you. Uh, one final question this week, uh, text question 
uh, comes from um, John in Western Australia. We'll get to his um, second question at the end of this, but uh, he says, hello, Professor Fred and Andrew. Thank you for your fantastic show. I've got a couple of questions relating to a few points that have been discussed in recent episodes. The first question is, can you explain what we have learned about the interstellar medium from the Voyager missions and uh, what the implications are for various concepts for interstellar propulsion, such as uh, buzzard ramjets, light sails, magnetic sails, etc. So let's tackle that one first. Yeah, so um, the, the, the interstellar medium, so that's the region beyond the, uh, the, the, the influence of the sun, the magnetic influence of the sun, yep. um, is, uh, is, is not much different from what's inside the solar system. It's just that the magnetic field is a different strength and the field lines go a different way because you're, you're sampling the, the magnetic field of the galaxy rather than the magnetic field of the, of the sun itself. So um, in terms of, uh, you know, any effects they might have on magnetic propulsion systems, it's, it's the same as it is inside the solar system. Um, I, I, I think that kind of idea uh, of using magnetism to drive spacecraft along is a non-starter. There's not enough oomph behind it. Yeah. However, light sails are a different, a different matter, and they're they yes, they're electromagnetic because photons are particles of electromagnetism. Uh, but what you're doing is you're providing an artificial source of photons by blasting the this thin sail with uh, high energy. Uh, photons from a laser, which might be in orbit around the Earth or something like that, and and gradually accelerating the spacecraft up to uh, uh, up to speeds comparable with the speed of light, sort of you know tw 10, 20, 30 percent of the speed of light, which is very yeah. significant indeed, and that might take us to Proxima Centauri in a short time. Um, by short, I mean twenty years. Uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, so so the interstellar medium itself would would not behave significantly differently from the medium, the interplanetary medium, if I can put it that way. Uh, there would be differences, but it, it, it wouldn't be a showstopper, for example. Okay. Uh, now, um, John also asked about uh, the sun's binary. We, we're we not going to really uh, dwell on that because we did talk about that recently. Uh, he did ask if Proxima Centauri could be a candidate, uh, and the answer is no. Probably not. No, it's more likely it would be a star um, of the same category as the sun, having been born in the same cloud of gas. So yes, the, the sun sibling, it probably had one 4.57 billion years ago. Uh, it's a long lost relative, unfortunately. Yeah, we don't know where they are. Now, speaking of relatives... Um, <laughs> Good segue. John, John had <laughs> one more question, uh, if you would allow, he said, a non-space question. Uh, Andrew, are we related? See, John's name is John Dunkley. And I've done some research, John, and what, I, I've been doing my family tree through um, Ancestry.com and I have got back to the 1400s. I found two knights. Wow. Well, yeah, Sir I, Andrew. Yeah, doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> Very doubtful, in fact. I love um, it. But uh, I um, have... One one of the, the the process is so convoluted and so complex. You start finding that you're adding cousins and brothers and sisters of cousins and brothers and sisters, and you you get this massive conglomeration of names. So to make my life easier, I stuck with direct bloodlines. So the answer, John, is could be probably Dunno. Uh, because I, I've not kept all the names that sort of break away from the mainstream in my family tree. I do know that uh, we came to Australia three generations ago and uh, my family arrived in Sydney and spread out over New South Wales. Some went down south uh, into Victoria and Tasmania and most stayed in New South Wales, and in fact, one branch of the family ended up where I am now. And they were they were a different branch through a for a uh, through a, a brother of my great grandfather that ended up here. So that's why I found a lot of Dunkleys 
in this part of New South Wales and wondered why. It's, uh, it's actually, yeah, there's direct connection going back three generations. Uh, I also know of an Andrew Dunkley who fought in World War I. His name is on the West Australian War Memorial in Perth. He was killed in, First War, in the First World War. He may be one of your relatives and he may be connected to us somewhere along the line. So... Um, and another, uh, so yeah, I think it's possible, John, but I'd have to go back and add some names to various branches until I found you which or, or found your branch of the family. So let's just say it's very, very possible. It's not a common name. So, no, yeah, it, it is likely that we are connected somewhere along the line. Um, so, yeah, I'd be interested to find out. And thanks for your questions, John. Lovely to hear from you. you must be a good bloke being a Dunkley. <laughs> Um, well, you remember, it's probably it's years ago I sent you this, but I came across um, the, the Dunkley motorised pram, oh, uh, yes. which is something that was produced in about yeah. 1900. Mm. And uh, <laughs> this is something you pushed your baby along, but it had a you know, two-stroke motor. To, so that sounds like a Dunkley invention yeah. does that. Well, I'll, I'll tell you another weird coincidence involving the Dunkleys. I once interviewed an Andrew Dunkley who played fullback for the Sydney Swans AFL team. Oh, really? When he okay. retired. And uh, so Andrew Dunkley interviewed Andrew Dunkley. He's since That's... had a child named Kyle who now plays AFL and my eldest son is named Kyle. And does he play F AFL? He does not. He plays no, video games. <laughs> <laughs> but the yeah, AFL. so uh, Andrew Dunkley, the swan, Andrew Dunkley, the broadcaster, both had sons named mm. Kyle. Mm. <sighs> Just weird coincidence. coincidence. Yeah. Yes. All right, that brings us to the end of another show. Thanks to everybody. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for listening. We really appreciate it. Uh, it is always lovely to hear from you. So don't forget to visit our website, spacenutspodcast.com. And while you're there, you can uh, click on the various links up the top that will indicate, uh, you know, that you can catch up with astronomical news or you can... Uh, uh, ask questions of us. Now, on the AMA tab, you can either send us text questions or audio questions, but on the right-hand side of the page, on its side, kind of like um, uh, Uranus, which I'll pronounce the right way, uh, send us your voice messages. So you can do it that way. Uh, there's all sorts of ways of getting uh, messages and questions to us, so we'd, lo we'd love to hear from you, as always. And, uh, you know, the best of the best will get on, on the program. Um, and sometimes not even that, um, as, as John now demonstrates. Uh, but anyway, um, we, <laughs> no offence, John, but you're a Dunkley, you can take it, you're tough. <laughs> um, but, that, uh, yeah, that's the place to go. And, of course, if you are into social media, don't forget to visit the Space Nuts podcast Facebook page. This is where people who love astronomy and, and have all um, sort of come together as a consequence uh, or as a result of the Space Nuts podcast can talk to each other about various things that are happening astronomical, uh, share each other's astronomical photos. I know a lot of people do that with their astrophotography uh, or just debate issues. It's, uh, it's all there and uh, uh, available on the Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook. Whew, that's a mouthful. Um, and that brings us to the end of this uh, latest episode. Uh, thank you so much, Fred. Always good to catch up with you. It's great to catch up with you. It's an honour to be in the presence of a Dunkley. <laughs> I wish my wife thought the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Catch you later, Fred. See you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Fred Watson, astronomer at large. He'll be back next week. I will be too. And thanks to Hugh in the studio for keeping it all running smoothly. And until next time. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. <laughs>